Hi, welcome back to Inside the Studio. I'm here today actually in the atelier uh, with Bruno Capolongo in Grimsby, Ontario. So Bruno, thank you for um, agreeing to chat today and, and to have uh, our viewers learn a little bit more about what you are and who you, where you came from and what you do. So thank thanks you. For, thanks for coming. You're quite welcome, my pleasure. Um, it is a beautiful atelier, I must say, uh, and your space is remarkable. And um, I wanted to focus a little bit on you as an artist and your journey, your artistic journey. And perhaps we should start with um, your childhood memories of, of being an artist and, and how your parents supported you um, as a child. Okay, well, at first they didn't because like uh, most parents, when they hear that you want to be an artist, uh, it doesn't sound like a reasonable career choice, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but it wasn't until, mm, I mean, I got my first commission at age 12 from a public school. Uh, but it, even at that point, it wasn't, that didn't do it. It wasn't until, you know, years later, you start winning awards and start selling and more and more recognition. And eventually they warmed up to it. And so oh, it's one of the reasons why before I was, uh, before I was 20, I, was, I think I was, what, maybe 16, I, they actually built a studio for me. Wonderful. Uh, which was, yeah, which was great. Fantastic. So, commission at the age of 12. Yeah. What, do you remember what it was? Yeah, sure. Uh, it was the outgoing art teacher of an elementary, uh, the elementary school where I was going, actually. And uh, he was much loved, and he seemed to uh, appreciate me at the time. And, and so they thought it was a good idea for, uh, for that to be his grand gift. So they had me do a, a painting for him. And were you one of those kids in school where, you know, your art teachers always thought that you were going to go somewhere someday? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. They could recognize your talent yeah. early. Yeah. It certainly wasn't uh, my interest in architecture and uh, design uh, because I was told not to pursue that because my, my math was horrendous. So. <laughs> like most artists. I guess. Yeah. However, some of your pieces are architectural in quality. Yeah, yeah that, I mean, even the studio was designed by me, I'd write down to the finest details. So, uh, yeah, that, I mean, I just became a member of the Institute of Classical Architecture and Art, which is like 95% about architecture and design. Hmm. You know, that's... Is uh, that an American institute? Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's almost entirely, the membership is almost entirely American, yeah. Right. Um, and so you finally convinced your parents that perhaps you had a, 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 enough of a desire to go forward into the art world. And you are making your way now currently yeah. as a full-time artist. Um, so your, your, um, your academic journey was interesting in that you went to OCAD, you went to the Vermont uh, Vermont College of Norwich University, right? Um, and yeah, DVSA before between high school and the Ontario College oh, okay. of Art. Actually, you... I, I was accepted immediately into the Ontario College of Art and Design, and I chose to do my foundation studies more locally at DVSA. At DVSA, which is Dundas yeah. Valley School of yeah. Art, for those people mm -hmm. that don't know about that. Yeah. You know why? It felt like an art school. OCAD, it's a great school. OCAD did not feel. It felt like it was a. Actually, it was designed by people who designed hospitals, and it kind of felt like that at the time. Well, now, not, any, now not anymore. <laughs> not anymore. No, not with the new addition and all that, no. And did you have some uh, faculty members th uh, that were um, inspirational for you during those really formative years of your development? Uh, well, throughout, I mean, and I'm going to mention her intentionally because I didn't in past uh, interviews and articles, and she gave me a hard time, and I, I deserve it. Maria Gavinkova at the Ontario College of Art actually was one of the most influential people. Um, and I'll, I'll stick with her in particular because uh, like a lot of art students, I wasn't sure whether you know it was worth doing this or that. And she challenged me, she said, you know, you should try still life. And I said, uh, what, what can you say with an apple? And she gave me a nice talk. And she said, <laughs> every her. single problem that you encounter in painting the human figure or anything else, you encounter in painting fruit. And wouldn't you know it, years later, I, be, I became a still life painter. And most of what I've sold in my career, when you add everything up, still life. 
What did she mean by that, Bruno? So she she was talking about form and shape and everything, and, yeah, and texture, and color, color, line, right. uh, composition, format, uh, size. I mean, all the elements of design for sure. that are considered for any painting are also mm -hmm. considered, and all the challenges, technical challenges in a painting that you encounter in a figurative painting or whatever. They're all there. And you know, apples are really affordable models. Mm -hmm. They're not unionized. Or, ah. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, and you can always eat your, uh, your setup when you're done. So that's always <laughs> nice too. So. That's terrific. Yeah. Well, there always usually is a, is a good coach along the way. Yeah. Um, and so what were you doing in Vermont at the school in Vermont? So I was already, you know, I had just, uh, just less than a year before I got married. So I was, fresh out of the Ontario College of Art, um, about a year into marriage, and I still felt like I needed to, you know, I needed more theory, conceptual challenge. And uh, the program at Norwich University, Vermont College, uh, was very conceptual, very theory driven. As a matter of fact, most of the faculty, the faculty was from around the world. Mm. And even though it was in Montpellier, Ver uh, Vermont, mm -hmm. which is a very, you know, beautiful, small very. town. And, yep. But that program could have been in Manhattan because mm -hmm. it was that advanced and that uh, progressive, if you like, and so on. Uh, so uh, yeah, I for, it, was a, it was a very intensive program. So uh, it was 24 months, no breaks, very intense. Uh, I was one of the youngest students because it was for people who maybe had put off finishing what they wanted to education-wise until later in life. Uh, it was a low residency program, meaning that you know you're you're there some of the time, but you're also back here where, wherever you live. Some people came from Europe, and you choose instructors to work with, which then become affiliated with the program. It's still going on now, of course, and uh, uh, and then you get to work with hand-picked instructors or professors in your region, your home region, and then you go back there for residencies as well. It was it was it was good. Um, and it, it was uh, something I guess I, I just needed I needed that mm -hmm. to say that you know I did that uh, I didn't do it for the master's degree the, you know, the fancy paper on the wall I did it because I wanted to deal with some challenging issues and hot button subjects and just a lot of theory and con conceptuals and a totally stuff. different feel as you say from OCAD in many respects, oh yeah right yeah, yeah. Um, and so because that particular part of the country is so beautiful um, and and atmospheric did some of those um, things that you were learning at that time translate into what you're doing today? Um, so for two years, I, I mean, a, a lot of the work I did is very different from what I'm doing now. Um, we, won't, we, we won't get into it, but it's, some of these things are still with us, I'm you know. Sure. Um, uh, the, the largest piece I did is actually uh, in the collection of a public uh, gallery. It's a very dark piece. It's, mm. it's strangely appropriate for the time we're going through mm. right now. Mm. One, one university president called it prophetic. Mm. Um, and what year was it's that? It's called Soul Cages in 1999. Okay. And uh, it 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 was a uh, two it was a diptych eight, uh, like almost ninety inches high, and uh, dealing with a lot of people in a city walking uh, towards the viewer, and uh, mask like faces, barcodes on the head, uh, very dark, very sort of nineteen. Uh, what's what's the, what's the book again? Nineteen eighty. Back to or nineteen eighty four. Nineteen eighty four. Yeah. Right. Yeah, very Orwellian. Um, right. Yeah. We're going to take a short break, Bruno, if you don't okay. mind, and uh, we'll come back in a few minutes because we have lots to talk about. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks. So, Bruno, we are, are back to chat about um, what I find to be a most fascinating aspect of your work, um, and that is Kintsugi. And uh, I wonder if you could share, please, the process, the meaning behind it, why you're attracted to it, and how you are doing such beautiful things here. Okay, so I didn't even know about Kintsugi until 2014. Oh. And uh, it was, um, I actually remember, you know, when something happens and you remember it vividly, I opened an email and there is an email from um, an organization that I, I uh, my work is, has been auctioned off to benefit uh, the anti-trafficking. Anti anti and they used a beautiful uh, Japanese 
bowl that had been broken and repaired into kintsugi because as, a, as an emblem of um, like rebirth, restoration, redemption, um, and also just on a technical level for me, I mean, as somebody who had been doing these multi-panel paintings uh, as sort of an interim uh, because of this desire to bring abstract and contemporary and very traditional elements together, that was, you know, my method using these very um, uh, straight lines and almost like Mondrian, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then when I saw the Kintsugi, it's like, again, all these things just came together and I said, okay, this is going to make a major impact in my work. And so since 2014, uh, you know, my next solo show was all Kintsugi after that. And from then I have, I, I knew that I've got many years of work here invested, it's going to be invested in Kintsugi because there's so many levels. So what is Kintsugi? So the story is that in the 15th century, uh, a Japanese shogun uh, damaged some of his prized uh, uh, China, China wear, and uh, he sent it back to China to have it repaired. It came back stapled together, and he was, he was dismayed. Like, how can this be, you know, the only way that, that we can do this? And so craftsmen found a much more beautiful mm. way to mend that which was broken, and su such that often these things are more beautiful for having gone through the trauma mm -hmm. and going through just, you know, the ins and outs of uh, the wear and tear of life, shall we say, right? And so for me, that, uh, uh, that symbolism, uh, if you like that metaphor for life, uh, that uh, as I put it before, you know, uh, life throws chaos at us. Mm -hmm. uh, we can make all the plans we want, but mm -hmm. the fact is we're not in full control. And, you know, for me, that was important to understand because I was a person who... Uh, you know, if there was just something slightly off with my gesso, I'd be upset. Well, Kintsugi, with Kintsugi, there's an embracing of chaos. And so I literally start with chaos now, which is a completely different way for, of thinking for me. So to, to, to make sure that I embrace this idea that uh, uh, one need not control or even try to control everything in life, I literally start uh, using chaos as a, a creative tool. And then I take the shattered uh, panels and I work with it. I can't control it, but I can work with it. And so there's a, sort of this, you know, um, uh, play between chaos and control and Beautiful. this sort of marriage. Beautiful. And that's what you have to do with your life, right? You pick up the pieces and try to make something beautiful. So whether it was an illness you had, whether it was a broken relationship, your attitude is everything, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, having come through an illness, now you're equipped to help others, for example. And you can find beauty and fulfillment in helping other people. It's so beautiful, Bruno. Um, is this art form practiced in Japan today? Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, it's the source of it. It is the, and, and you know, and we're just talking about the simple. Of course. Uh, sort of stripped down. Of course. Uh, we're not even talking about the, 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 the greater philosophy of wabi-sabi yeah. behind it, which I'm not even probably, you know, uh, qualified to talk about enough. And then there's, you know, Kintsugi is sort of the umbrella method, but within Kintsugi, they, they break it down into other, uh, yo, Yobitsugi, um, Makianoshi, these are different styles of Kintsugi. And each one of those is just rich with symbolism as well. Wow. Um, and you're, you, so this one, for example, Bruno, is, um, is, a, is a bisque bowl. Yep. So has this been... Has this been shattered and put back yeah, together Yeah, so the bowl again? is actually fired in Italy, uh, uh, then brought to Canada. It's meant to be glazed, of course. I, uh, I decided that I would try something a little different. Of course, gold, that's 22 or 23 karat gold. It's shiny, smooth. Of course, the sea glass, which I picked up on the Amalfi Coast in Italy, is shiny and smooth. And I thought, what a wonderful contrast. Let's try something different. Uh, you know, since then... Everything else I've done on ceramic has been hand glazed by me and, uh, or, or select pieces that I've shattered that are pre-existing ceramic pieces. But, uh, so I have done a number of three-dimensional pieces as well. These are just exquisite. Congratulations oh, for an absolutely beautiful art form. Um, it, are you, uh, you're selling these out of your studio, I'm assuming? Yeah, yep. and uh, my, um, most of the galleries I work with deal contemporary art. And uh, there's not one gallery that does not like to work with this. I'm sure. And, and the galleries, actually the two solo shows I have at the end of the year in October and November, actually going into December even, 
uh, will all will be all kintsugi and uh, um, kintsugi related and still life. In other words, almost everything will sh will be either influenced by or actually be kintsugi. And where are sh your shows, Bruno? So Studio Twenty Two in Kingston, right uh, right across from the old Capitol Building, mm -hmm. uh, right downtown. And the other one is old Montreal at Gallery Blanche, mm -hmm. in in uh, I forget the name of the street, but beautiful, beautiful area. Mm, absolutely beautiful. Um, before we uh, move in another direction, I wanted to talk a little bit about your your painting because it's also exquisite, and I know that you're a perfectionist because I can see it in every aspect of your work. Mm -hmm. um, and what you're really doing is you're combining uh, the love of uh, classical with a very contemporary feel. This in particular is stunning. It's not, it is contemporary in a way, mm -hmm. um, but this is the uh, at the George Eastman House in Rochester, New York. Um, but in some of your other work, um, there is a, there is a, for example, your piece over there with a beautiful um, vase and the florals and your background is, is it's a combination of mm -hmm. the contemporary and the, and the, um, uh, Renaissance feel to it. So, what what what's what what is it about that aspect of combining those two things that you appreciate? I think you know. I think part of it is just heritage, right? Uh, at the age of twelve, I went for a very long trip. I should have been in school, but my parents decided to pull me out of school and take me to Italy. Awesome. And Good for you. it was a it was a life changing experience. Good. And in uh, what way? In what way, Bruno? We didn't just sit in some old family town, you know, because my, my family does come from uh, around Napoli, Naples, Italy. Mm -hmm. uh, but my father's restless. No, we were always on the move. And if we were driving and all of a sudden there's some Roman ruins, boom, out of the car. You know, so we were just always. So I saw a lot in that four or five weeks. I saw a lot. And uh, it just, uh, it, you know, it set me on... Uh, uh, on a course, I guess. So, and yet, we don't live in classical or Renaissance or ancient times. Some of us do in our <laughs> minds. I know, I know. And, and uh, I mean, the books I have and the things I look at, I mean, like I said, uh, you know, I, I almost feel like I'm living in the wrong century. But nevertheless, you know, whether I was in one art school or another, I, I also loved pure abstraction. And very influenced. I mean, some of the work I have in, in a university collection in this case, are two enormous 11 and 10 foot by seven and five foot uh, uh, pure abstract pa paintings. And I've got a lot of abstract paintings out there. But in, you know, in the 90s, I decided, ah, I gotta do something about this. So I decided to, to go put aside pure abstraction, go towards representational, but find a way to blend them. And this has been an ongoing thing. I, I feel like Kintsugi has been one of the best things for me because it naturally blends them. Wow, Bruno. Well, I wish you continued success. I'm certainly going to be looking forward to seeing your shows. Um, and I wish you continued success as everybody tries to maneuver through mm. these times. Uh, hopefully we are coming out the other end of things where people can uh, continue to enjoy seeing art in the flesh as opposed to the virtual world. Can I just mention one more thing? Yes, of course you can. These paintings are in process. This is, this is not a finished painting by any means. This is probably 30-40% into the process. Wow. Just want you to know that. Okay? Wow, <laughs> wow. But they're, but they're exquisite. So we will look forward to, to your shows. And are you open for people to come and visit oh, you by yeah, appointment? Uh, absolutely, or? absolutely. Technically, people can just call me and say, hey, I'll be there in five minutes. That's that's fine, and I, and you, and quite frankly, people show up here unannounced and uh, before, rarely now during COVID, but it happens, and and and, and that's fine. I do have posted hours, um, and yeah, I'm I'm very open and uh, to the public. Well, I I can't imagine that there aren't many um, art lovers, fine art lovers, that wouldn't appreciate looking at your work. Oh, thank you. So thank you for doing this for me. My pleasure. Thanks. Um, and Bruno, you are uh, you have do have a cause that's very near and dear to your heart currently, uh, and uh, can you explain what that is and why it is so important for you to want to share the message? Okay, and and, and the the kintsugi is perfect because uh, kintsugi is what introduced me to anti trafficking, human trafficking, and in particular, I mean all trafficking is bad. Okay, 
but uh, the, the sex trafficking is, is especially vile in my mind because it is so invasive. And we're not talking about just losing our freedoms. We're talking about losing freedom in the most intimate way, right? So uh, for years, I've been benefiting uh, Radanac International, which is an anti-trafficking organization founded by a Canadian, former RCMP officer in Canada. Um, and more recently, I, ju I just had a Zoom chat uh, with uh, the YWCA in, in Niagara, and they have a safe house, and they, ha they have... They've made it official. We have a problem, not just uh, in all of Ontario. Niagara has a, because of the tourism and because of the casinos. And I'm, I'm not blaming the casinos. I'm just saying um, we have a problem. So they're seeing more and more need and more and more clients. And they're literally saving and, and helping to restore uh, uh, these young ladies and women. So some women as young as 11 mm -hmm. are being approached for mm -hmm. trafficking mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so i'm hoping that i can also we will be well, i mean we just had this initial zoom conference we'll be working together i will be uh anything i can do for them and uh, i'm personally thinking that again the kintsugi work because of the symbolism for restoration sure. redemption redemption renewal right. rebirth right um, right and that's a, that's true for what these women have to go through mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as well why right. well thank you for sharing that information thank you so we're back and uh, Bruno, you're going to demonstrate for us um, your process to get from here to there. I know you said this is only 40% finished, but perhaps if you can show us the smashing process mm. and what happens after that. Oh, my pleasure. Okay, so yes, yeah, so this is uh, um, possible because I found a material uh, which breaks like ceramic, just you know, very much like Kintsugi, which is all ceramic based. So yes, uh, to get to this, uh, uh, first you have to, you know, uh, have this this panel, which I end up gluing, and this is an early stage, as you see, and it's uh, it's really enjoyable because you have so little control. So right. rather than cutting and trying to plan, you yep. just break Bang. it, and I'm gonna do it, and Bang. you'll see. Okay, there we go. And you pick up the pieces, and the art begins. You pick up the pieces, and the art begins. Magic. And you're using, I mean, you're using, you said 22 karat gold? I've to, used to as much as 23 karat gold. And um, uh, yeah, I, I use white gold, 22, 23, and uh, I'll probably expand it because there's others available. So you can get 24 karat gold as well. Right, right. Yeah. So there we yeah. go. <laughs> yeah. Let, let's see what is that me on the floor Bruno yeah and I'll, 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 <laughs> who knows what I don't even know sometimes I, I'm responding to the breakage and then that suggests what I should do I don't even know what I'm doing yet I'll, I'll literally respond to what which is beautiful what shattered right which is beautiful yeah. so what actually will this look like when it's finished uh, you know what this is the wonderful reality is that I no longer plan things so carefully forward because Kintsugi has, uh, has, has, has been this wonderful dynamic so that as I create these nine panels, uh, I will not finish one and then have to make all the, the others match it. I will, I will be making many at the same time and uh, you know, eventually one will finish and it'll be like a domino effect. So it's, it's a wonderful kind of uh, question mark to me too. Uh, there's precedent for it. So you know, if you go to BrunoCapilano.com, Bruno you'll see things that will indicate but I'm looking to evolve the work my work is always evolving so and is see. it always nine panels that you incorporate onto the piece there is a precedent for that too there's there's one uh, um, series of nine actually it was ten but the nine sold together called uh, Chu Te Chun which is a famous Chinese artist who lived in Paris who was um, very famous for his abstract work but also ended up late in life doing these beautiful abstract bowls Blue, white, and gold. Mm, beautiful. Beautiful. Wow. Fabulous. Thanks, Bruno. Thank you. Thanks for coming.